Well, with regression, I don't think you can ever get enough practice, right? So I think what would be the best use of our time today is to repractice what you just did on your homework to start with, emphasizing things to work at, remembering to some degree. Of course, your final exam will be take home, so you won't really have to remember. But if you do work at trying to remember things, it will kind of get into your soul a little bit more, more deeply, you might say. And uh, you might be able to more quickly do things, in, including on the take home, for example. You don't want to spend too much time on the take home than you need to. You want to be as efficient as possible. So let's go ahead and go through the exercises that you did for today, as well as do some new things as we go through these exercises. So this is exercises 16 through 22 about the make span data. So you've got a certain industrial situation where you've got a number of jobs on some machines, maybe four jobs, maybe five, et cetera. And the make span data is supposed to be, it sounds like by reading the problems uh, related to how long it takes to, the, to do the jobs. You know, the units depend on the situation. These could be in minutes. They could, if it was real fast jobs, they could be in seconds. Or if they're real long jobs, these could be in hours or days. So it depends on the situation. Let's go ahead and go through the entire process that you might think about with regression. Now, of course, the quickest thing to do is to go right away to that um, regression output. But let's start instead by reviewing formulas to try to get remind you of all the formulas that we've encountered so far, plus some new ones. So let's start. It's good to, by, uh, to start by making uh, rows for the summations of the, the columns. So I'll go ahead and label this row with, well, sums. If, I, I think I might be keeping the uh, what you see on the screen here smaller than normal, so it is good if you have the spreadsheet open so you can see it bigger. I'll, I'll make it one size bigger here. If you are don't have a computer with you, you might want to move forward here just in case it's too small for you. So we'll use built-in function equals sum for sum. Looks like the numbers here in the setup here are starting in row four. So this is going to be B4 through B15. How many data points is that? You could think about doing 15 minus four and adding one to it. 15 minus four is 11. Add one to that. There's 12 data points. If you want to double check, you can always count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Data points N is 12. Copy and paste that formula over. You're going to get the sum of the Y's. Okay, so that's good. It might be good to also like freeze this row. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but in a spreadsheet, like the Google Sheets here. Let's see, I think you got to do it through the edit menu, perhaps. No, the view menu, go to freeze, one row. When I'm below the row I want to freeze, whoops, that didn't do it. I guess that only freeze, froze the first row. Instead, I guess I want to freeze the first row, four rows, up to row four. Nope, undo that, up to row three. I assumed it worked more like a and Excel there. There we go. So I was in row three and I, on Google Sheets, I froze up to row three. So that now as I scroll down, I'll see what's in row three and above. Which means maybe I want to uh, zoom back out a little bit. <clears throat> it's also a good idea for the purposes of, for example, illustrating the values of SSXX and SSXY, and there's going to be one more today, SSYY. If there's an SSXX and an SSXY, there's got to be an SSYY. It's a good idea to compute the means of these things as well. Of course, you could do that by dividing these numbers by 12. N is 12. Maybe I want to just make a note of, of that over here. N is, let's put that up here. N is 12. That's not a data point. I could divide by 12, but you could also, of course, do equals average. Like that. Copy and paste that over. 
There we go. Just a coincidence that those are close together. I do want to illustrate the other formula for the slope that I mentioned. So I also want to compute the standard deviations of these numbers. Equals STDEB. And I also want to compute the correlation R. Now I mentioned the correlation R before. We've had the technology computed for us before. I've hinted at the meaning. We are going to see a, a formula for the correlation today, pretty soon, in fact. But just for the moment, let's do equals correl 2Rs 1L B4 colon B15, comma C4 colon C15. The correlation, as I'm about to show you, can be used to compute the slope of the regression line with a formula that I have shown you before, but you probably haven't used on homework before. If it's really close to one, positive one, that indicates a, a strong linear relationship with a positive slope. If it's really close to negative one, which it won't be here, that indicates a strong linear relationship with a negative slope. It's usually not real close to one or real close to negative one for most real life data, you might say. I don't know what happens with this one. Okay, it's pretty close to positive one. What I meant by real life data is I meant real life data where you really are applying the regression model. Yes, sometimes real life data like this could be pretty strongly correlated. I was thinking in terms of the regression model where you're gonna have a fair amount of scatter above and below the regression line. I have mentioned also that the coefficient of determination, which is R squared, it is a better measure of the strength of the linear relationship. We are gonna make that more precise today. What does that exactly mean? You can just square the correlation of course, whether the correlation is positive or negative, the squared correlation is going, to, is going to be positive. It's pretty close to positive one. It's a pretty strong linear relationship here. Let's go ahead and make our scattergram. We see a pretty strong linear relationship, though we do see something else interesting. And this is something worthwhile paying attention to. I could put a regression line in here. I guess I will. Under series, add the trend line. <clears throat> Something somewhat atypical is happening here for the most part, except for the first two points. The points bounce back and forth above, below, above, below, above, below, above, below the regression line. That's not typical. And if something like that happens in real life, you should probably try to look into why that might be happening. It's not typical when you, when you truly have a situation where regression is most appropriate. You really should have random scatter about the regression line above and below. And it really should be random. There shouldn't be some sort of pattern to it above, below, above, below, above, below, above, above, below. below. It shouldn't go like that. Let's compute the slope B1 with that alternative formula that I don't think I showed you on Tuesday. I think it was last week. Alternative formula for the slope. B1 is that it equals the correlation times the ratio of the standard deviation of the Y values to the standard deviation of the X values. Okay, that formula as far as I've noticed, at least is not in the book. Let's test it here. Take the correlation, R, not R squared, times the ratio S sub Y divided by S sub X. Saying the slope is 1.16, that, that's what you should have gotten on the assignment. This is a homework problem. 
we could show the equation just to confirm it. Yep, 1.16. See it there? Intercept B0. Y bar minus B1 times X bar, right? That's the same formula always. And we haven't used a different formula other than that. Y bar, the mean of the Ys, minus B1, the slope you just found, times X bar, the mean of the Xs. You can see on the graph, it's about negative 1.44. Yep. Wanted to get those in there as quick as I could. And notice that they're in cells B23 and B24, because now I'd like to illustrate some other things. I do want to illustrate the SS formulas and their relationship to the slope and intercept, but I also want to illustrate some other things like the residuals, the squared residuals, the SSE. I want to try to confirm all the formulas and remind you of all the formulas at the same time here. I think it's worth doing. And you should try reminding yourself of these formulas. It's worth doing for the sake of clarity in your mind and for the sake of efficiency when you're doing the take home exam or homework for that matter. So you remember these things as quickly as you can. I guess I will make these columns skinnier because they won't need to be real wide there. Make this skinnier too, a little bit. I am going to add a new column for y squared values. And we're going to com compute a new quantity, SSYY. So as you would expect, in cell D4, do equals B4 squared. Copy and paste that down. I'm squaring all the x values. In cell E4, do equals B4 times C4 x times y values. And in cell F4, do equals C4 squared. There we have it. Now, if I just go ahead and copy and paste the sum formula over into these spots, those are going to be my SSs. No, um, no they're not. They're going to be related. I, I, I jumped ahead too, too quickly here. They're going to be related to the SSs, not equal to them. Copy and paste this over. Use those to figure out SSXX, SSXY, and SSYY. I'll put them in these spots. Okay, let's remind ourselves what those formulas are. The definition again of SSXX is this. I won't bother with the I goes from one to N. Again, I'll assume all summations I goes from one to N. That's the definition. However, I remind you that we use a different formula and it's not the same it's not the same as the numerator of the other formula for b1 in the book's first form of it because remember in that formula they multiplied the top and the bottom by n this really is xi the sum of the xi squareds minus the sum of the x's quantity squared over n we could put that in the numerator for the formula for B1 and SS, excuse me, the denominator, SSXY goes in the numerator. But then if you do, you have fractions within fractions. And so that's why you ended up multiplying the top and the bottom by N. There's SSXY. Here's a new one, SSYY. 
what would it be? It's going to be something similar. Mimic SSXX, except replace the X's with Y's. This truly is a sum of squares. We haven't made use of this, this one yet, but again, we will today for the correlation. <clears throat> but let's compute these first. Got those down. Let's compute them first. SSXX, sum of the X squareds. There it is, D17. Minus the sum of the X's and B17 squared over N, N is 12, which was in cell A4, I think, but I'll type 12. SSXY, sum of the X times Y is there in E17, minus the sum of the X's times the sum of the Y's divided by N, which is 12. SS, SSXX and SSYY are truly sums of squares and can't be negative. SSXY in theory can be negative. And in fact, if the regression line has a negative slope, it will be negative. Our regression line has a positive slope, so it will be positive here. But this in general can be negative. Finally, this new one will be this minus this squared over 12. I'm going to make a temporary column G just to confirm SSXX in a different way using the definition. Using that. But then I'm going to erase that column. So just to confirm that the, the definition gives you the exact same thing, let's do it that way too. Briefly. I won't even bother labeling the, the column. <clears throat> Take each X value in B4, B5, et cetera. I am gonna be subtracting the mean, which is in cell B18 and will stay as an absolute cell reference in cell B18. So I gotta use dollar signs. If I add these numbers up, that should be SSXX. So if I copy and paste this over, I should get 143. Yes. Okay. Now, now I'll go ahead and erase it. That was just to illustrate. Let's also, excuse me, let's also reemphasize. <clears throat> How to find the SSE, so many SSs. There's even more in the reading. That we haven't gotten to yet. And let's also confirm another formula for SSE that it perhaps is the formula you ended up using if you needed it. Yeah, I think you needed it. We could make a column for the residuals. And we could make a column for the squared residuals. Or just the resi squared residuals. But I'll do both. We'll need the slope and intercept, which are in cells B23 and B24. Remember, remind yourself what the residuals are. Think, think. What are the residuals? EI. It's yi minus yi hat. <clears throat> the ith residual ei is yi minus yi hat. Yi has got a hat there because it's a predicted value from the regression line. This is yi minus 
B1 XI plus B0. Or B0 plus B1 XI, it doesn't matter. Of course, you can distribute the minus sign through, but for the sake of a spreadsheet, we will be subtracting here. YI is in column C. Subtract, okay, I guess I will need parentheses. Dollar B dollar 23 times B4 plus dollar B dollar 24 by itself. That's B1 times X plus B0. Residuals should be somewhat close to zero, you would think, because it's a strong linear trend and about half positive, half negative. And in fact, they should add to zero up to rounding. And the spreadsheet says exactly zero when it happens. We could approach regression by trying to minimize the some of the absolute values of these things, but absolute values are difficult to work with. So that's why we minimize the sums of the squares of them because they're easier to work with. Square the residuals. Oops, I forgot one. There we go. And then add them up. SSE, sum of squares of errors, is going to be about 7.61. Let's now find the regression standard error. Just a plain old S is our symbol for the regression standard error. That's square root of this thing divided by what? What does that get divided by? N minus two. There's n minus two degrees of freedom. I was actually thinking about assigning the problem of showing s squared is an unbiased estimator for sigma squared. It's actually, I mean, it's a multi-step problem, but this, each individual step is actually not that hard. Problem 13, it, it looks hard. It looks harder than it actually is. There's n minus two degrees of freedom. n is 12, so n minus two is 10. Regression standard error is about 0.87. Remind you what this is supposed to represent. This is supposed to represent an approximation to a standard deviation. What standard deviation? Standard deviation of the capital EIs in the regression model. Those things. They're assumed to have variance sigma squared and standard deviation and sigma. S squared is an unbiased estimator for sigma squared. S is an estimator for sigma, not an unbiased one, similar to how, how with variances and standard deviations, S squared was unbiased for sigma squared and S was not unbiased for sigma. But we use it anyway, because like, well, what else are we gonna use? <clears throat> Let's confirm another formula that we haven't confirmed before, but you might have used on your assignment if needed. Haven't used that formula yet. SSE can be found by this thing, which is our SSYY minus the slope times SSXY. Haven't used that formula before. Let's use it. Let's confirm that it works. So again, it's that SSE. Yes, it is the sum of the squared residuals, but it also turns out to equal, it can be shown, SSYY minus in the abstract capital B1 times SSXY, where I'm thinking of capital B1 as a random variable, but we can of course use this formula for observed values too. 
I'm trying to confirm the value of SSE. According to this formula, it should be SSYY, which is right there, F17, minus the slope. What was that in B23? B23 times SSXY, which is in cell E17. So this should be also 7.610799. No, it's not. What happened? Oh, I was I was taking the wrong numbers. I I took. Sorry, I missed my bad. For SSXY and S SSYY and SSXY, I took the wrong numbers. SSYY is in cell F twenty one. Slope is in B twenty three. SSXY is in F twenty. That should be 7.610799. Okay, it is. So that's the formula we haven't used before. That's one, one new thing for today. What's another new thing for today? The correlation formula. The derivation of the correlation formula is actually not difficult. Go back to the definition of the correlation coefficient for random variables. This was in chapter five. If X and Y are random variables, this is called the correlation coefficient. Take the covariance of X and Y divide by the square root of the product of the variance of X with the variance of Y. We haven't used this formula in this class. I think we did a little bit in province stats, though we mostly focused on competing variances and covariances. But I think we did maybe at least one example where we computed a, a correlation at least with, with computer help in province stats. It's always between negative one and one. And when it equals one, it's a perfect linear relationship when it equal, or, or negative one. What we want is an estimator for that for data. And the derivation is actually not difficult. Um, take nat, you might call natural estimators for the variances. Book says they are maximum likelihood. Are they method of moments? I'm not sure. I haven't double checked that. These are natural estimators for the variances. They're not the same as S squared, because with S squared, you'd be dividing by N minus one instead of N. In fact, if we divided by N minus one instead of N, we, we would get the same thing. And I guess we, I mean, we could have probably used, well, okay, I guess, Let's not worry about using dividing by n versus n minus one here. They also use an estimate, a natural estimator for the covariance using the SSs there. Notice these are the definitions of the SSs there, there, and there. Plug those into this formula effectively and effectively cancel the ends, and here's what you get. We can write that, and I write that in terms of the SSs as I've been doing. So in terms of SSs, that formula right there, I will write it on the sheet here. I typically use a, a little r. I mean, it's, it depends on whether you're thinking of it as a random variable or not. I'm going to use a little r. SSXY divided by the square root of the product of SSXX with SSYY. That's the correlation. Let's confirm that it gives the right answer. Go ahead and put it here. Of 
what was it when we used equals coral i think it was 0.98 something let's see if this gives the right answer ssxy divided by the square root of the product of ssxx and ssyy we should get 0.98 something yep. there we go An alternative formula for the correlation in terms of summations is right there. Yeah, I don't want to have to use that. But in the olden days, they had to, or they had to compute the SSs first. I mean, effectively, these are the SSs multiplied by N. What do we want to do with this? Let's first talk about interpreting it. And let's also talk about something else I haven't talked about, Con a conceptual point to make. <clears throat> the textbook emphasizes, and I'm about to emphasize the same thing here, that when you're doing regression of y on x, you're trying to predict y when you know x. And in the theory, you're treating y as a random variable and x not as a random variable. x is deterministic, you might say. And you're thinking about when you know given x values, what, how does y behave? With correlation, the textbook emphasizes you're truly thinking of both x and, x and y as being random variables. You're not looking at the dependence of y and x. In fact, you're not really playing, you're not really making a distinction between explanatory and response variables. You're just looking at the relationship between variables themselves. Is there a linear relationship or not? That also emphasizes that if you change your perspective on the roles of X and Y with regression and decide instead of trying to use X to predict Y, you want to use Y to predict X, you actually get a different regression line. And, but you get the same correlation. The correlation ends up being the same. And conceptually, it's not just a different line with a different formula. It's not even, it's not even gonna be the inverse function of the, of the other regression line. It's going to be something completely different. And here's a, a picture that I'll just draw by hand, and I think would be worthwhile for you to draw by hand. That kind of emphasizes what I'm trying to get across here. Say you have an arbitrary looking cloud of data that's got to say a moderately strong linear trend to it. Of course, you're not going to draw the exact same picture as me, but try to draw something somewhat similar. Say something about like that. <clears throat> if I had to eyeball where the regression line of Y and X is in this picture, how would I do it? It's tempting to think in this overall kind of uh, football shape cloud of points. So this red curve I'm trying to draw real very lightly is supposed to sort of like, you know, be a, an oval, a football shape that's kind of showing you the shape of the data there. It's tempting to think that the regression line is gonna truly follow the trend, what you might say, and go from this point here through the data like that. That's the temptation. And that temptation is, is typically warranted when there's a really strong trend. It does seem to do that kind of thing. However, 
if you actually, if your data actually looks like this, that will actually not be what the regression line looks like. It's more subtle. If the shape of the data is about like what you see there, the regression line is going to have a bit smaller slope than you would think. It's going to be, it is going to go through the point whose coordinates are the mean of the X's and the mean of the Y's, as I've already said. Which I'm not saying is a data point, right? That's rarely a data point. It will go through that point, it's sort of like the middle of the data. But its slope is going to be smaller than you would expect. It's going to be a bit more like this. Why? One way to think of it is that, remember, you're trying to minimize SSE. You're trying to minimize the sum of the squares of the errors, where the errors are really occurring in the vertical direction. Not some slanted direction. You might say a line looking about like this, watch what my pen does, but I'm not actually going to draw it. A line looking about like this would minimize sums of squares of errors in some sort of slanted direction, you might say. But that's not the same as minimizing the sum of the squares of the errors in the vertical direction, which are differences of y values. Making some pretty important conceptual points here. A line with a smaller slope will do that. Here's another way to think of it conceptually. What are we trying to do for any given x value with the regression line? There's two things you're typically trying to do, either predict y or predict the mean of y. Actually, in the model, you're really trying to predict the mean of y. If you imagine various vertical slices of points here where x is effectively constant, maybe pretend, pretend I've got many more points than I've drawn here. And each thin vertical slice of points that you might think about might have a fair number of x values in it or fair number of data points in it. For each thin vertical slice, what the regression line is trying to do <coughs> is it's effectively trying to estimate the mean of the y values in that thin slice. And if the y values are truly, say, normally distributed like they should be, in, like they are assumed to be in the model, it should be effectively a symmetric distribution. And the mean, say, for this value of x of those y values should be effectively in the middle in the vertical direction, which a point right around here is not a point up here, which would be if the regression line more, looked more like this. So. Practical consequence of all this, one practical consequence of all this is when you call the regression line a trend line, that's really only working pretty well when it's a real strong linear trend. If you got a lot of scattered through your data, yes, the spreadsheet's still going to call it a trend line, but it's not a trend line in the way most people expect. Second comment here that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So this is this is um. You could call this y hat equals b1x plus b0. That's for predicting y when you know x. Second comment is if you were trying to predict x when you know y, it's going to be a different line. It's not going to be that green line. It's not even going to be the inverse of this function. Because if you found the inverse function of this function and didn't swap the variables, it would be the same line. It would have a graph that's the same line when you don't swap the variables with inverse functions. I'll call this f of x. If we call that f of x. If we were trying to predict x when we know y, x, x hat equals some linear function of y c1 y plus c0 call that g of x or g of y excuse me 
G of what G is not the inverse function of X. You cannot solve for G by solving this equation for X. It cannot be done. And its graph in the same picture is going to be different. Because what you got to think about is you got instead of thinking about vertical slices, you got to think about horizontal slices. Fixed values of y, you're trying to estimate the mean of x. And that's going to make the regression line in the for predicting x when you know y look more like this. And its slope would be bigger than what you would estimate for the trend line if you were thinking about the slope as a rate of change of y with respect to x at least. Got this one. Uh, I should have colored that one green, I guess. That's this one. <clears throat> so some practical things to consider. Let's get back to the homework problems. You were also trying to compute. I'm not going to do the homework problems in full, in a sense. I'm going to just try to do well, maybe the maybe the last things. Well, okay. We do want to test for significant regression, and then also let's compute confidence intervals and prediction intervals. So, for testing for a significant regression. We're testing the null hypothesis then that beta one is zero versus an alternative hypothesis that beta one is non-zero. And probably I'm imagining most of you when you did this homework problem you just use the analysis tool pack output and the p-value that you got with that. I'm imagining that's what most of you did. And I said that was fine. I said you could use technology. Let's go ahead and get the analysis tool pack output and we'll compare with what we get with the formulas. I guess this is taking up most of the class today. I was hoping to maybe start chapter 12, but we're not gonna have time. I think this is this is definitely worthwhile to do. Reinforce what you just did. So let's go to um, data. No. Extensions. Excel minor. Go down to linear regression. The Y range is C. C4 through C, what was it, 15? Although I want to include the labels. Okay, so I really want to start at C3. The X range is B3 through B15. Output range, I just want to go down here somewhere. Maybe column G, okay, I've already got a graph there. Let's put it down here, I'll upper left corner in uh, cell F34, say. Residuals, residual plots. Okay. So in testing for a significant regression, what I'm imagining most of you did was just look at that p-value. There you go, really tiny. We're testing whether beta one, the slope, is zero or not. The p-values that you're given here in the output are automatically two-tailed p-values. Very, very small, very, very extreme t-stat. We're definitely going to reject the null hypothesis that beta one is zero. P-value is very small. So reject H0. Beta one, we've got very, very, very strong evidence that beta one is non-zero. It's a two-tailed p-value, of course, a one-tailed p-value would be even smaller. So you also have very, very strong evidence that 
beta one say positive if you're if you were doing a right tail test which would make the most sense to do ahead of time remember when you set up hypothesis tests you really should decide what your alternative hypothesis is ahead of time before you gather any data that's the most honest way to do it so if you set that up if it made sense to that the make span would be larger as it, the number of jobs gets larger as it, it does make sense uh you would do a right tailed test and get an even smaller p-value but the spreadsheet is programmed to do a two-tailed test so it is a significant regression is the conclusion that you should make but let's confirm the t-stat in particular with a formula if i asked you to do that on the final exam you should be able to it's based on what we did in class on tuesday based on the distribution of b1 its distribution being normal with a mean of beta one and this, that variance. And when you replace sigma squared with its natural estimator S squared, where S is the regression standard error, then you get a T statistic with N minus two degrees of freedom. That's the T statistic to compute. Let's compute it now. We'll use the spreadsheet to help. So it's B1 divided by the ratio of S divided by square root of SSXX. Do that in the spreadsheet. What's the observed value of the T stat? B1 is the slope, it's in cell B23. S is the regression standard error. That's in cell H18. SSXX is in cell F19. Can I remember those things? H18 and F19. Slope divided by square root. No, use parentheses. H18 is S divided by square root of F19 is SSXX. B1 is in B23, all divided by the ratio S, the regression standard error is in H18 divided by square root of SSXX. This should give us the 15 something, right? That's what we saw in the output. Yes, 15.9115 matches that. Should be able to do that if I asked you to. Okay. You know, this is kind of a long class to sit through. It seems longer than usual. Remember, it was this day that we did that if you wanted to look back at the video or something. If we wanted to test the, uh, if we wanted to confirm the T stat of the inter intercept, we got to use its distribution. And you'd have to use ultimately that formula there. Yikes. Using B0, the intercept, using S, the regression standard error, using SSXX, using N, the sample size, which is 12, and using, a whole surprise, some of the X squareds. Those things are all in the spreadsheet, including the 12 in a certain cell, though you could type in 12 should be able to do it in both cases you should also be able to compute these confidence intervals this one for the intercept if i asked you to and this one for the slope okay let's now go on to the confidence interval and prediction interval when you use the regression line Let me write down the formulas from memory. I've got them memorized. <clears throat> they are both confidence intervals, actually. We assign levels of confidence to both of them, but we call the second one a prediction interval. 
confidence interval to estimate mu sub y given x. There, that was the original purpose of the regression law, is estimating that thing. We assumed that A equaled beta zero plus beta one X. So this interval is getting back to the really the, the heart of the purpose of regression lines, at least when you've got a lot of data. When you when you don't have much data, which this, you know, this example is not much data. You got a lot of data. And maybe it's not a super low, strong linear trend. You got a lot of spread. This and the prediction interval, you could say, are the heart of the purpose of regression. It's written as mu hat y sub x plus or minus t sub alpha over 2 based on n minus 2 degrees of freedom times S, <clears throat> you might think that we could, you know, if you were taking a real naive approach, you might think we could stop there. Think about the regression model. Sigma squared is the variance of the capital EIs. It's measuring the spread and it's standard, it's square root, the standard deviation, sigma is measuring the spread in the vertical direction of the y values for any given x value. And it's constant no matter what x is. S is an estimator for sigma. I mean, if we knew sigma exactly, this should do a decent job of, of estimating. The mean. Or, well, no, that, I said that wrong. This kind of thing should do a decent job in the case of a prediction interval of estimating y values. That, that was the better way to say it, not the mean. Pretend that's not the mean there. But in the case, in that second case, I, I spoke too soon. Uh, okay, let's just finish this one. The formula is it's multiplied times the square root of one over n plus x minus x bar uh, squared over SSXX. <clears throat> Realize that when you've got large data sets, this thing is going to be a fairly small number. This is small when n is large. For one thing, you got a one over n in there. That'll be small when n is large. For another thing, SSXX will tend to get bigger and bigger as n gets bigger. So that fraction will tend to get smaller and smaller as n gets bigger. So I'm multiplying by a fairly small number here when n is large. And so that makes my interval smaller. The bigger n gets the smaller the interval is, as long as S itself is not too big. As long as it's a pretty a decent, decently strong linear trend. On the other hand, for a prediction interval, to estimate Y, maybe I want to call it a capital Y actually, And by the way, you use the regression line to compute the point estimate in both cases. But with the prediction interval, we write this thing, the first thing differently. The point estimate is typically written y given x hat. But it also does equal b0 plus b1x. Okay, here's where I should have made the comment about you might wish that you could get away, away with approximately what you see there. Because again, that's getting back to the purpose of regression, coming back to this picture. 
for any given X, you're trying, the regression line estimates the mean of Y, but with the data, there's spread around the mean, the vertical spread. Whose variability is measured by sigma squared and sigma. No matter what X is, it's a fairly consistent variability. It's actually not quite true in this picture here, but that's what the, the way the model goes. However, because you're doing estimates based on a sample, you can't get away with this. You need an extra factor that's a little bit bigger than one to give you a little more cushion. The extra factor is the same as what you see there, except with a plus one inside it. And when n is large, this will be close to one. Slightly bigger than one. When n is large. Because you're using a sample, you need some more cushion in your estimate. Another thing to notice with these intervals is that the margin of error gets bigger. You might say less certain the further X is from X bar. These things are, are both minimized when X equals X bar. These are minimized and minimized when X equals X bar. In other words, the intervals that you get are smallest when you're near X bar, where you kind of the middle of the data set for the values of X. We're most sure of things you might say near the middle of the data set. I hope that's pretty intuitive and kind of satisfying that that happens. And it's illustrated conceptually in a graph in the book, this graph here. What's going on in this graph for any given X, like say one of these, the graph is giving you in the Y direction, the lower bound and the upper bound for confidence intervals in this case for mu, but we could also get a similar picture when we're estimating, we're using prediction interval. Should I take the time to compute these? Uh, I hope you felt okay doing doing these uh, using technology again. You did need the value of SSXX at least. That might have been the hardest part. I think I'm not going to do them because I'd like to spend ten minutes, the last ten minutes, doing something else. So, in doing this problem, you need this number. So I hope you realized how to compute that. by doing this minus this squared over 12. You need a given value of X as well, and that should have been given in the problem. You're trying to find these intervals. Yeah, first of all, add X equals X bar. That makes the intervals as small as possible. And in part B of number 18, it was at X equals 12. In part D of, no, of number 22 is X equals 50. You have to be told what X is. There's actually another, another way to find SSXX. And SSYY for that matter. This is worth knowing. The sample standard deviation of the X's by definition is the square root of the variance, which is the square root of what really ends up being SSXX divided by N minus one, not N minus two. Because that's a chapter six thing right there. You could solve that equation for SSXX. Square both sides. And then multiply it both sides by N minus one. SSXX, an alternative formula for finding it is it's n minus one times the, the variance of the X's. 
And likewise, SSYY, an alternative formula for it is N minus one times the variance of the Ys, squared standard deviation, using the N minus one for those variances, or using the equals STDEV in the spreadsheet, will automatically do the N minus one and square those things to get the variances. So you could use these formulas too. At the end of chapter 10, there's also some information about alternative ways of testing things, including a test statistic for whether the correlation is zero or not. I might have signed a homework problem where you use that. You can do a hypothesis, that hypothesis test based on this test statistic with n minus two degrees of freedom. You actually should get the exact same answer as testing whether beta one is zero or not. Maybe, well, that'll be part of the homework to confirm that. I think what mo mo might be most worthwhile to end class today is to show you something in Mathematica. We'll do more with Mathematica next Monday we'll, or next Tuesday. We'll also do definitely do some, some R next Tuesday and start chapter 12. Let's end by looking at Mathematica. <clears throat> We're trying to compare these tools. I did figure out how to deal with the raw data from the spreadsheet here. Let's go through the process of doing that quickly. And then I wanna show you some new things. So this, remember, you can get raw data from a spreadsheet by importing. And you, if you start typing import, you can, I thought there was a file browser. Didn't it come up before that there was a file browser? <laughs> okay, fortunately I, I can copy and paste it back in. You need the path to your, to your spreadsheet. There it is. Unfortunately, one thing unfortunate about this that's worth knowing is that it has a couple of lists at the end that are empty. So we need to get rid of those. Um, what did I do to get rid of it? Effectively, uh, raw data with one inside double square brackets, we'll get rid of those. Now I just have the actual data though including the labels is a little complication. This is the T-bill rates and inflation rates. Um, how does Mathematica work here? If, for example, I do this, That's going to give me the very first. That's going to be give me just the labels. If I do this with a two there, that's going to give me my first data point, including the year. If I do a three there, it gives me my second data point with including the year, et cetera. If I add on another number like a comma one here, this will be. If I had to do a comma one, it's going to take the first element of that list, which is the year 1960. If I do a two, it's going to do the second element, which is the first. The 3.2 right there. And if I do a comma three, it's going to do the third element, which is the 1.36. Without explaining, this code is going to generate lists that are just the years, just the T bill returns, and just the inflation rates. You've used table a little bit. I think probably in the past, this is a nice way to use table to get just those things. And now I can use transpose to write the inflation re real rates and T-bill returns as a list of points. And finally, I can do fit like we did before. You just mimic what I do here. For sake of time, I'm not fully explaining it. What I'd like to spend a few minutes doing though is seeing what linear model fit can do. 
Linear model fit is mathematic as a way of essentially doing regression. In R, it was just a plain LM. I've got an LM over here, but that's just my variable name. I'm going to store the output of linear model fit into a variable name that I'm calling LM. You don't see much, but there's stuff going on behind the scenes, and that's what I want to show you here. If you go to Documentation Center and look up linear model fit and look for some examples of things you can do, we can, for example, get some tabular output, like an ANOVA table that I haven't explained yet. I need to do that next Tuesday as well. So I could do LM ANOVA table inside quotes to get an ANOVA table. Did I do that right? Oh, I got, I got the ANOVA has to be all capitalized. That's the middle part of the spreadsheet output that I haven't explained yet. Need to do that next Tuesday. And there's other things you can get as well. Uh, looking for more examples. We could, for example, get parameter confidence intervals. The syntax would be to put parameter confidence intervals, copy and paste this into here inside the quotes. This is a confidence interval. For either the slope of the intercept, this is a confidence interval for either the slope or the intercept, which is which? Well, the slope is centered at 0.7 and the intercept is centered at 2.3. This has got to be for the intercept. This one's got to be for the slope. Same kind of thing as you would get in the spreadsheet output. It's all available. I have looked a little bit at what R does to do this kind of thing. It does some similar things. Okay. And I'll show you that next Tuesday. So next Tuesday, I need to explain the ANOVA output. Also in relationship to the end of chapter 11, we need to do some stuff with Mathematic and R. And we need to start chapter 12. Okay, we'll see you then.